All right, good morning. Uh, we will try to be, we've got a wide array of uh, speakers, but I think our, our topic today, new genetic and immunological treatments, implementation, we're really gonna talk about bringing things to the table for children, really being, quote, hashtag disruptive to the algorithm. And on that note, I really wanna start with youth. And so I'm gonna introduce first and foremost, Dr. Kara Davis. Kara is a native of Philadelphia. She's even a Penn State alum. Um, she is a rising star. Whenever I'm trying to ad advise Dr. Leonard behind the scenes about growth and opportunities in pediatric oncology, Kara is always on my short list of the people that will be carrying the program over the next couple decades. So it is my pleasure to introduce her topic. But before I do, I just want to let you know how topical breakthrough we are. Uh, as proof of it, right here, if I can get it together, come on. Um, anyway, I just received an email uh, all of about 10 minutes ago that said, CAR T cells are just a click away. So it must, it must be topical. Uh, but let, let's, let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Davis and not delay any further. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I, I hope CAR T cells are that easy, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning, and thanks for everybody for getting up early to come and hear uh, this uh, discussion, which I think is going to be really interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a very exciting, uh, I think, advance in cancer treatment that right now is really benefiting children with leukemia. Uh, and it's truly a personalized approach to therapy called chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So I want to touch on a few things this morning as the outline of our talk is that childhood ALL, B-cell ALL, is the most common cancer in children. And certainly, I think it can be uh, described as really a poster child for the success in cancer treatment really across the board. But there are still patients who don't benefit from this success, and I want to talk about who they are. Then I want to really focus on what are the um, advances that this new technology, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, has brought to the field, which is harnessing the power of the immune system and uh, marrying it with synthetic biology um, so that we can really make improvements for these kids. But there are still challenges that remain even with this. So 100 years ago, roughly, Childhood leukemia was universally fatal. This is a report from Dr. Gittins from Alabama who describes for the course of his children with leukemia that they would be uh, succumb to the disease usually within two or three months, uh, and that was a standard. Uh, there were no approaches to treat the children. Fast forward now to our current era, and we've made incredible strides over the course of this century in treating children with cancer, and specifically B-cell leukemia. So the green line on this Kaplan-Meier curve shows in the 60s, about 20% of patients survived on childhood leukemia uh, studies. And now, on current studies, we're above 90%. So that's a pretty amazing trajectory of cure. But there are still patients who are not cured, and relapse disease is really a problem. And this is one of our patients, Sal, who was featured recently in a Stanford Medicine article um, who had relapse disease uh, and benefited from this treatment, CAR therapy. If we look at the studies and the attempts to improve outcomes for children with relapse, we really haven't made much impact. So this, these uh, curves are from a paper in which they looked at uh, studies for relapse leukemia that were performed in kind of the late 90s, early, um, sorry, 80s, late 80s, early 90s, and then split it up into later studies from the late 90s, early 2000s. And you can see the curves pretty much overlay on top of each other, meaning that we didn't really make much progress despite trying new things and, and uh, new ideas. So in comes the CAR T cell, which is a little bit of a Frankenstein cell, I think, if we think about it. Let me tell you what it is, what the CAR is. So the, chim the chimeric antigen receptor is the combination of the business end of a monoclonal antibody, I'm going to point to it on this side, which is the part of an antibody that recognizes a protein or the antigen that you're looking for in an infection, with the um, signaling components of the T cell that are the intracellular portions that actually activate a T cell to go after an infection. And so combining these things um, through engineering, you can create this receptor that's going to specifically target something of interest. 
And so the way they work is when you have your chimeric antigen T cell, the T cell now expresses this Frankenstein receptor, if you want to call it that, um, and it's going to recognize specifically the target that is expressed on the leukemia cells or the cancer cell. It could be applicable to many types of cancer and even infection, actually. And once those two things engage, the T cell is activated and the cancer cell is eradicated. So the concept of CAR T cells has been around for about 30 years. And the first clinical trials were in the mid-2000s, adults with solid tumors. And there was really no response. And patients received the cells, but they didn't stick around. They you know, pretty much went away very quickly, and there were no, no responses. But in the early uh, part of uh, the second decade of, the, of this century, um, early studies in adults with lymphoma, B cell lymphomas, started to show some promise. And so there were persistence of these cells in the patients, and there were patients that were starting to have some response and remissions. And then shortly thereafter, some reports were coming out about using these in acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, in uh, adults and children with really incredible responses. And these were like two patients published in the New England Journal, things like that. So now if you look in the more recent last few years, we're starting to see the reports coming out of you know, single institution studies in which multiple patients and cohorts have been treated. These typically are like the worst of the worst um, as far as patients who've already had transplants, patients who've been through all kinds of chemotherapy, and we are reporting response rates between 70 and 90 percent of patients. So it's in pretty incredible. And when I made this slide about a month ago, um, there were 103 clinical trials listed on um, clinicaltrials.gov for CAR T cells across many diseases, and there's two FDA-approved products, and we're going to talk about that. So one of the things that's really key in this type of therapy is finding the right target. And so this talk is focused on B-cell leukemia. So one of the uh, first things that started to jump out was that B cells normally express some particular antigens, cluster of differentiation antigens called CD markers. And so in a series of patients, you can see that CD19 and CD22 are both very highly expressed in many patients. And on the patients that express them, most of the cells have them. So they were really good targets because you want to try to get everybody. You want to get all the cells. You don't want to get most of the cells. So those are the targets that have been most studied. But an interesting effect of this, I think, has been that the way the CAR T cells are designed affects how they act. And you could probably have an entire talk about that alone in and of itself. But just to kind of highlight the, the two big differences, I think, in the field um, and not all the nuances, are a lot has to do with the co-stimulation domain. So T cells require two signals to be act optimally activated. And co-stimulation is very important. And so in CAR T cell design, people have used the CD28 co-stimulation domain or a 4-1-BB co-stimulation domain, and various groups have chosen these as they've developed their programs. But what we've seen now clinically in the patients is that when you use the CD28 co-stimulation domain, you get a big burst as far as cell number early, but the cells kind of peter out and go away within three months. You can't really see them as much in patients. But in the 4-1-BB cells, they kind of ramp up slowly and expand, and then they persist. And so there are patients, I have patients who have had CAR T cells two years ago, and they still have no B cells, and I still can find their CAR T cells. So they persist and kind of give you long-term tumor control. We can argue about whether or not that's good or bad. So as Paul said today, you know, it's just a click away, it's so easy. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about what happens to the patient and what happens to the cells, because it's totally different than calling the pharmacist and saying, hey, I need this drug. So what happens is you identify your patient, they undergo a procedure called apheresis, where their T cells are collected. Those cells kind of leave and go down this bottom part of the pathway, where they are sent to a lab to be engineered, they're activated, they're transduced either by retroviral or lentiviral transduction to get the CAR T cell uh, DNA and express it. They're expanded to make the adequate number of cells for the patient. And then they're sent back to the center to be ready for infusion. In the meantime, the patient is in the hospital or out of the hospital being maintained and hopefully in his best kind of clinical status as you can. And about a week before you administer the cells, you give them lymphodepleting chemotherapy, similar to conditioning for stem cell transplant, in which you want to actually prepare them to receive their T cells. So 
Before I talk about efficacy, I want to take a minute to show you, you know, before CAR T cells, what was our best bet in the armamentarium for relapse patients. So standard chemotherapy for relapse disease, clofarabine, etoposide, cyclophosphamide, it's been around for decades, terribly toxic, um, lots of infectious complications, 20% survival in this series of relapsed children. So not great if it's not really going to work anyway. A more recent um, uh, drug is called blinitumumab. It's a similar mechanism to CAR T cells, except that instead of it being an engineered, it's actually a bispecific antibody. So it grabs CD19 on your B cell, it grabs CD3 on your T cell, brings them together, and it, it uh, is cytotoxic in that way. So, but the work in children um, also shows at a year survival between 20% or 40% of you had an early response, but still I, would, I think is pretty suboptimal. And we know that blenitumumab is not really a um, definitive therapy. So it works when you have it, it's a continuous infusion, and once you stop it, it's gone. So you kind of, your anti-leukemia effect is gone. But in the early papers um, in childhood ALL, so these are two different centers, the outcomes were really astonishing. So on the left-hand side is uh, the data from Crystal's trial at the NCI using a CD1928 CAR, so the short-acting one, and they saw, saw about 80% um, survival in patients who had achieved MRD negative remission. And then at the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania, which is the curve on the right, um, there was 67% survival at six months, and actually there was 90% disease response at a, at a month. So really, there was really incredible kind of response um, compared to what we already had available for patients, um, you know, in similar patient groups. So the data from CHOP actually was what uh, kind of spurred the uh, pivotal trial, which was just published last month, or two months ago actually, it's April now, um, in uh, the New England Journal. And we participated in that trial here, uh, and uh, it was called the Eliana trial. And so uh, Novartis licensed the technology from Penn. And then the purpose of the trial was not only to see if you could have similar efficacy across multiple centers, but could they actually establish a global supply chain where we're doing this shipping of cells back and forth across the country. And I'm not going to talk about it here, but offline I can tell you about adventures in shipping cells in commercial airplanes. Um, but uh, just to say that th it really uh, stood the test that patients had great responses. So there were 92 patients uh, who were actually enrolled of, of 107 screened. 75 actually made it to infusion, and again, there were some patients that never even got that far because they died of disease before their cells were manufactured, or there were cell manufacturing failures. So those are, again, some of the caveats about this therapy. Um, but uh, of those 75 that underwent infusion, this is what the uh, curves look like. At six months, the overall survival was 90%, and the event-free survival, 73%. There were patients, a very mixed bag, who went on to transplant following this, and so they're censored at that time. But overall, you know, I think that the survival and the remission rate was really astounding for these patients, especially considering that these were patients from all, actually all over the world, not just all over the country. And so we were all learning how to do this, how to take care of these patients that, you know, we never had done anything like this before. And it actually was really a, quite a learning experience for me as well. So based on those results, um, the FDA actually uh, approved what is now called Kimraya commercially, um, or Tisagen Leclucel, that's the generic name, but it's hard to say, um, for approval. And this was really incredible for two reasons. So it's the first cellular therapy that's ever been approved by the FDA, first gene therapy approved by the FDA. And as a pediatric oncologist, the most really astounding thing, it was the first time a cancer therapy was approved for a childhood indication before it was approved for an adult indication. So that was amazing. And shortly thereafter, actually, um, Yescarta was approved. Uh, that's the KITE product for relapsed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in adults. So I want to touch on the adverse events. Um, there are both real adverse events and theoretical adverse events. And I have B cell aplasia kind of highlighted here because I'm going to talk about it now but not get into depth. But, you know, to say that one of the potential side effects that's kind of a well-tolerated side effect because it means your therapy's working is that the CAR T cells are going to target anything that has its, the target. So CD19 is on healthy B cells, so they're kind of a 
off disease but on target bystander effect that happens. And so patients become B cell aplastic as long as they have their, their car. And it's actually one of the ways we can monitor do they actually still have their car hanging around. But then they require um, immunoglobulin replacement and kind of monitoring for infection. But the kind of two main um, toxicities I want to touch on today, the first of which is cytokine release syndrome. So when I talk to patients about this and the side effects that are potential, I kind of describe this as having a terrible flu. Because when we give patients the T cells back, you're basically inciting a huge immune response. You're saying, T cells, go in here, find your target, and then the T cells do what T cells do. They recruit all the other members of the immune system, and there's lots of cytokines that start flying around, and patients feel terrible. And so we see things like fever, malaise, headache, hypotension, tachycardia. Sometimes patients require mechanical ventilation. Sometimes patients require vasopressors. And typically this happens between three and up to 21 days after they get their cells. But usually it's all done and gone by the end of the first month. We know a little bit about CRS, that it has to do with how much disease the patient has at the time they get the cells. So if you have a low burden of disease, your risk of severe CRS is low. But if you have a lot of cells and a lot of disease, you're much more likely to have severe CRS. And then there's been a lot of groups that have shown, oh, it's so funny, this is flipped. <laughs> Um, anyway, there's been a lot of groups that have shown that the trajectory of symptoms, you can also track cytokines along with it in the patient, so that at the time that patients get their first fever, um, in that first kind of week, we also see spikes in interferon gamma and IL-6. And actually giving anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibodies like tocilizumab is one of the ways that we treat cytokine release syndrome, and it actually was also FDA approved at the same time that the, the cells were. A second emerging, I think, toxicity, which I would say is a little bit more scary as the clinician now, is this uh, CAR-T-related encephalopathy syndrome, which I think has recently coined its own term, because we knew there were neurologic effects with CRS, but we weren't exactly sure if they were all the same or if it was different. And we saw that using anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibodies didn't fix it. So, Uh, the group in Seattle did a really nice paper that was published at the end of last year where they looked at, you know, correlates to predict neurotoxicity with CAR. And the kind of clinical things that we see are sometimes delirium, confusion, um, aphasia, difficulty finding words, and up to things like paralysis or seizure, which are much more scary. And typically, you know, the vast majority of them are reversible and they also remit by the first month. But uh, there are some patients who actually have died of herniation um, and severe cerebral edema and DIC. And so one of the things is trying to understand who are those people and how can we figure out who they are. So the group in Seattle did a, a review of a over 100 patients who had gotten CAR for CD19 malignancies, adults and children. And one of the things that they found was that having severe CRS put you at higher risk for having severe neurotoxicity. So we kind of understood there's something about this big inflammation that's happening in the body that is having an effect on the brain. This is an MRI of a patient who had cerebral edema. Um, and further work by their group looked at um, endothelial factors in like the cerebral vas vasculature that actually seem to correlate with this neurotoxicity. So not necessarily that it's a direct, we don't think now it's a direct target Um, issue, like there's hidden CD19 that we didn't know about in, in the brain, excuse me, in the brain, but more that uh, that big inflammation that's happening is affecting what's happening in the brain, and there's more um, kind of uh, immune uh, activation that is, that is causing this. So more to understand about this, but certainly something to think about as we start, as we start thinking clinically about using CARs for brain tumors um, and, and other indications. So I wanted to take a minute just to touch on theoretical adverse events, um, which are things that we have to talk about when we tell patients about these therapies, but have not actually been observed uh, in any patients. So these are things like uh, replication-competent lengthy or retrovirus from the actual transduction that happens in the lab, and then insertional mutagenesis uh, in T cells and whether or not that could set someone up for cancer. So, Insertional mutagenesis or oncogenesis is something that has been observed in gene therapy trials for things like SCID, in which using and altering a stem cell can set someone up for subsequent development of leukemia. Um, and that has been observed and is something that has kind of put a pause on the field to try to understand how do you deal with that. Um, 
the data here, which also doesn't project exactly correctly, but is a paper from Carl June in which they looked at insertional um, locations across the genome in, in T cells from patients who were setting up for CAR T cell therapy. Um, and they basically found that there was, you know, very little association with inserting in, in oncogene locations, that there was a lot of, there were some um, preferred locations in the genome, but th that, you know, there was not, um, a, they didn't feel that there was a high um, uh, propensity to go into areas kind of of risk that we think about that could set someone up for leukemia. In addition, these are what we think to be fairly terminally differentiated cells, probably not exactly, but that they're not necessarily having the same kind of capacity to become a cancer cell as a stem cell would. And then the issue of uh, replication competent lentier retrovirus is something that we have to uh, look for in our patients for a very long time and is a regulatory requirement. There was a huge uh, review of this done recently published in 2018. And you know, based on all of the testing across multiple centers and thousands and thousands of tests, it's never been observed, but it's still a requirement and something that we have to talk to families about. So, What's one of the big problems here? You got this great therapy. We're going to cure everybody with it. It's very exciting. Um, but you know, this is one of the parts that most interests me, is that it's starting to reveal the plasticity of leukemia and how leukemia is so tricky. And so it remains elusive. And so some of the things that we started to see emerge is that we start to pressure an antigen, CD19, and the leukemias come back and they say, ha ha, I'm not going to express CD19 anymore, good luck. Um, and so that has been one of the main uh, relapse forms that has been seen in this therapy. And it usually occurs within 12 months. Um, but I would say recently, and with more patients getting this, we're starting to see patients relapsing farther out. And so uh, initially we thought it was, you know, around half patients were relapsing with 19 negative disease. But actually in that New England Journal paper, over 90% of our patients had negative disease. So we know this is going to grow as a clinical challenge. This is an example from Children's Hospital where they, in Philadelphia, where they had about 7% of cells in a 19 low gate at the time of infusion. And when the patient relapsed, you know, all the cells were there. And this is some of that same patient's data from my lab using um, mass cytometry to look at it with many different types of antigens. And we can really clearly see these cells here are colored by CD19, that there's definitely a population that was there at the beginning, and that was capable of growing out to the whole leukemia again. So what's a way to circumvent this? One thing that we're doing here are multi-specific CARs, so let's pressure two antigens at the same time. So instead of having a CAR that only can look at 19, we're having one that can look at 19 and CD22 in this case. And so the preclinical data, whoops, too fast, shows um, that if we treat mice with leukemia with either a 19 CAR alone, a 22 CAR alone, or the bispecific CAR, which is labeled here as loop, we can get the same leukemia control in those animals. And we have a clinical trial, two clinical trials open, one on the adult side for lymphoma and one on the pediatric side for leukemia. I think we've treated seven patients so far between the two trials. This is a nice example of one of the lymphoma patients who went in with disease in the abdomen and the chest, and after receiving, about a month after receiving the CAR, had a very good partial response, especially of the disease in the chest and some in the abdomen. And that patient still has maintained his response and has detectable CAR now, so, you know, four months out. Our three leukemia patients that were treated were all rendered MRD negative and from this therapy as well. So there's a lot of questions that remain, I think. Um, a big, and these are the clinical ones. When do you use these cells? Should we use them at diagnosis right up front? Should we use them after chemotherapy for everybody and just shorten what is usually a two-year-long course of chemotherapy for patients? Or should we use it only in patients who have residual disease and we think are at high risk for relapse? Or should we use them only at relapse? A next question would be, how do we use them? So are they a definitive therapy so that you don't need to follow it up with anything else, especially when we have persistence for years? Or are they a bridge to transplant, um, to get someone into remission and then give them a, a bone marrow transplant, which would be kind of what you would do for a high-risk patient? And then finally, how much disease is the best when you give the CARs? Um, minimal disease, so they have a low risk of CRS and neurotoxicity, or do you need a lot of disease to actually establish the cells and have them see enough target? Um, and so I think these are all outstanding questions in the field right now and things that we're struggling with as we are you know, starting to accumulate data. <laughs> 
And then the other really big question is, are these therapies worth the cost? So Kimraya, the commercial product, is $475,000 for one dose. So it was the most expensive you know, FDA-approved drug. I think it is the most expensive FDA-approved drug. And there was recently a patient advocate who said it's you know, not worth the cost. We did a uh, cost-effectiveness analysis that this is under review with some folks in the business school. And the answer is it is cost-effective if the remission rate is good enough for long enough. So 40% of patients' remission sustained for nine months, it's probably worth it. Um, but you know, that's where we don't know what the you know, long-term outcomes are. So with that, I want to say thank you to all the people who've helped with this work. There's a lot of people here at Stanford, um, the entire cancer cellular therapy. Crystal has been an amazing advocate, obviously, and pioneer in the field. And then the funding agencies, including CHRI, who have helped enable us uh, to get patients, as well as the Jimmy V Foundation, who's funding some of my research in this area. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Whoa, trying to get up here. And that slide of the femur didn't look good. Um, that was really great, Kara. And that's truly wow science. Just a shout out to Kara is doing incredible science. She just has a paper come out in Nature Medicine looking at relapse of leukemia at diagnosis. So you should definitely check that out. So keeping in the uh, move toward um, novel and innovative, it's my pleasure to introduce John Day. So John is one of our faculty at both Packard and at SHC on the adult side. He is a product first of, I think it was Oberlin, and then from Oberlin it was Minnesota, and then from Minnesota to Einstein to UCSF. We were lucky enough to recruit him here now, I think it's about six, seven years ago, where he runs both our pediatric and adult neuromuscular programs. What's incredibly exciting, particularly in my own experience as a neurologist, is what's going on in spinal muscular atrophy. What John is doing both locally and nationally is truly hot. It's changing. This is a disease, SMA1, that was previously more common than you think and universally fatal. So our job as neurologists was to go by and let families know that their little baby was going to pass away. So it's now a, not only a treatable disease, but even a potentially curable disease, which is really exciting to see. So it's my pleasure to introduce John. He's going to talk uh, in particular about where we're going in the treatments of SMA. John, take it away. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, and thanks to the organizers for allowing us to talk today. This is uh, very exciting. Um, I did come here about six years ago to help strengthen the neuromuscular program, uh, thinking that there really was a revolution about to break on us in this field. And so it's fun to see this actually materialize. Um, first of all, to cut, cut through the jargon, neuromuscular, for those who are not quite up to speed on this, just means that it's a disease that affects the nerves and the muscles and the arms and the legs. It doesn't mean that that's all that it affects. I mean, it can affect the brain, the heart, the smooth muscle in the gut. So when we take care of patients that are listed as neuromuscular, we get the whole package and we have to deal with all aspects of, of what's going on with their disease, but all of them do have involvement of the, of the nerves and the muscles in their limbs, and that allows us to do some very, very detailed testing that's uh, not available to the central nervous system. So watching uh, someone talk about blood cells that you can actually take out and fix and put back in is really you know, something that neurologists can't even begin to think about. It's not, it's not in our realm. We have to fix it where, where it sits. But by being able to study these diseases in detail by, being, by electrophysiology or biopsy or all kinds of different assays has allowed us to identify now hundreds of different genetically defined muscle diseases, hundreds of differently defined nerve diseases in the periphery. And so over the last 30 years, we've accumulated this list of large numbers of, of disorders. But as one of my patients told me about 20 years ago, when we were making all kinds of noise about having found a new gene, a new genetic mechanism for nerve and muscle disease, she said, you know, we really don't need another gene test. You know, what we need is somebody to be able to treat these disorders. And, you know, she was absolutely right. I mean, you know, we, we were telling people what they had, but it wasn't really doing them a whole lot of good. 
And it wasn't for lack of effort. So we tried and we tried and we tried. We have dozens of trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy or ALS, none of which were working. So they, all of these things look good in the mice, but when we'd come to trying them in, in humans, it just didn't get very far. And we didn't know, I mean, was this always a matter of the drug failing the trial, or was it really the trial failing the drug? That We didn't have the right population. We weren't really proving this in a way that would allow us to get to the next stage. So spinal muscular atrophy, as Paul said, is a devastating, horrible disorder, but it provided us with a very clean research opportunity. If you can abstract yourself from the devastating situation enough, you can see that this was really quite uncommon that we had a perfectly defined population. These kids are born looking normal. They look great at birth. At least we can define that population. And, and then uh, by three or four months of age, they begin to show signs of weakness and about 80% of them will die at one year of age due to uh, ventilatory failure and consequences thereof. So, I mean, that's a pretty unique situation where we've got a defined population, a known time course, and we know exactly where this is heading so that we can see whether or not our treatment really has an effect. It's also not particularly uncommon. Many of you have heard of cystic fibrosis. That gets a lot of noise, but it gets more noise than uh, spinal muscular atrophy because the patients live longer. It's about as common uh, to cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy. One in 40 people in the general population is a carrier for SMA. So you do the numbers and it's about one in 10,000 uh, of uh, live births have SMA, about 60% of whom, so 30 to 50 in the state of California per year, um, have SMA type one. And that's the one that I've been describing. There are uh, other forms of the disease. So we thought with this unique si situation that we could show whether or not novel treatments work. So if I was able to just come and say, okay, you all remember DNA structure and we did some mumbo jumbo and we came up with a treatment for SMA, that would be a cool talk and that would that would, that, that would be all I needed to say because it's really cool that we can treat this. But I was thinking that in this venue, it, it'd be good to actually take a step back and realize uh, you know, in, a, in a broader way the implications of what we're doing because this is a different type of gene therapy. When you hear gene therapy, most people think of, I think, AAV gene replacement. So you're just gonna stick in a new gene or if you've been reading you know, the newspapers of late, you think about CRISPR and gene editing. This is a different approach. This is, this is an approach that allows us to modify a gene, and we think that there are advantages to that that are gonna have implications for any number of different neurologic and systemic disorders. But to understand it, to put this in context, we need to think back about a little bit more of genetics than just whether there's DNA and proteins. So we need to understand the genetic mechanisms, the disease, uh, finding disease mutations, and then gene modification approaches, all of which then came together. So this really is 60 years in the making uh, to come up with uh, these treatments. So just to go through that briefly, defining genetic mechanisms, DNA obviously goes to protein, and when I was learning these things, that's all that was cared about was the DNA and the protein, but it's a little more complicated than that. So if we look at the DNA from pulling back a little bit, obviously the genes themselves are strung out on a chromosome like beads on a string, as is often said. So each of those represents an individual recipe or individual code to develop a particular protein. But if we look at any one gene in particular, it itself is broken up into different paragraphs so that that recipe is broken up into different paragraphs that then can be stitched together to create the entire code or sequence that's used to create that protein. As you probably also remember, the DNA itself is transcribed into RNA. And again, uh, this was just the most boring thing when I was learning genetics. I mean, we just kind of skipped over RNA. The focus was on DNA and on proteins, and the RNA was just that ridiculously boring thing in the middle that got you to the protein level that really mattered. 
what we've discovered is that there's an awful lot that goes on at the RNA level because it gets to be edited and, and changed in a bunch of different ways so that the RNA can itself be spliced in different ways so that you can take this recipe that's broken up into paragraphs and include one or another paragraph. You don't have to include them all. So one gene can, in essence, encode a number of different proteins. And this is all highly regulated. So the cell has a lot of different capabilities for altering which different isoform of a gene is actually expressed in a different cell at a different time. Uh, this, this is, this is uh, there's an awful lot of activity going on. It's possible to regulate it so that you actually um, alter the number of, of paragraphs in there. Basically, the entire recipe turns to junk and it just gets shuff, shoveled down the disposal so that you're, in essence, turning the gene off by regulating the RNA process. So this ends up being a fairly important area uh, that we can adapt. And there are many, many approaches to doing that, as we'll come back to, so that there are microRNAs, siRNAs, and different approaches that now are being uh, druggable uh, in terms of approaching uh, uh, this, this element of uh, cell biology. And then ultimately, that all goes on in the nucleus of the cell, which will come back to be important and it gets transported out to the cytoplasm where it's read into the protein. Okay, so that's the genetic mechanism side of this. The disease causing mutation, how do we locate that? That's been a long process. As I mentioned, for the past about 40 years, um, we've been there 30 years, we've been really doing this since the first gene in the neuromuscular field was identified in 1988, which was Duchenne we've identified literally hundreds and hundreds of different disease-causing mutations. For SMA, we had to start from scratch and look at all of that DNA from all of the chromosomes, which eventually led in the early and mid-90s to identification that something funky was going on on chromosome 5, eventually showing that there was a deletion on chromosome 5 of a particular gene, which initially was just called SMN spinal muscular, uh, or um, motor neuron uh, survival, survival motor neuron gene. And so the SMN gene was missing in uh, all SMA patients. Uh, it seemed to make sense. But it turns out that the situation in um, SMA is a little more uh, interesting than that. So there's the SMN1 gene, and like any recessive disorder, it's simply absent, it's missing. So you don't have that. That's the common situation in recessive disorders, that one way or another it's missing. The difference in SMA is that you have a, a second gene, as you might have guessed, SMN2. And so the SMN2 is sitting there in everybody. As I explained to parents, oftentimes the good news is that you have a, a, a spare tire. You know, so you're missing the one that you need, but good news, you've got a spare tire. Unfortunately, the spare tire is flat, so that there's a single nucleotide change at the five prime end of exon seven that alters the splicing. So there are the different paragraphs or building blocks for the SMN protein in each of these uh, genes but the splicing is altered because of a single letter in the genetic code being switched in exon seven. So rather than getting the full RNA uh, uh, transcript, you get one missing paragraph seven, and you end up getting no protein out of it or very little protein out of it. So that's a druggable situation. That's what allows uh, this unique approach to SMA. And then gene modification, this I've already kind of alluded to, one of the things that we've focused on is antisense technology. And as we've already talked about, the DNA is itself read into RNA, so that the, the G is read as a G, the, the T is read as a U, the A is read as an A, the C is read as a C, so that you get a, a basically a mirror image of the DNA read into the RNA, which is gonna go through that process I already described of protein formation. And what some very clever people realized back in the 70s was that you could actually build an antisense to that so that you can specify the code, you can synthetically create an antisense that will stick in one place and one place only, and that's on the target RNA. So it goes and it sticks on that target RNA, 
and then it's going to alter it. So it can alter it in different ways. There are ways that you can get it to wipe out that RNA. There are ways that you can get it to alter splicing so that it forces inclusion of one of those paragraphs or it forces exclusion of one of those paragraphs. There are a number of ways of doing this, but it turned out that this worked, that it would go and it would stick right where it was supposed to, but it's been an enormous uh, uh, feat to come up with something that actually worked in vivo. So that worked great in cells, but getting a system that would work reliably in animals and ultimately in humans has taken decades of work to try to develop because of several features. The antisense has to be very small in order to penetrate the cells of interest, penetrate the nucleus of interest, and stick on the RNA of interest. So it has to be tiny enough to make it all the way in, but it has to be long enough that it has the appropriate sequence to stick right where you want it to. If you have too short a sequence, it's going to stick to any number of different RNAs and not be specific. So that's part of the art. And then it has to be synthetic so that the cell doesn't just chew it up. If you use native RNA, it might stick theoretically, but it might never make it there because the body's own enzymes are going to chew it up. But it has to preserve the specificity, so it can't be totally synthetic. It has to be just right so that it doesn't get chewed up, but it retains its specificity of binding. So all of those features had to go into this process of these uh, pharmaceut small pharmaceutical companies that were running on venture capital for decades just to try to figure these things out. It was really uh, a matter of tenacity on their part to keep it going. So all of this came together for SMA, and there's our SMN2 gene again with its single nucleotide change at the five prime end of exon seven that's altering splicing and consequently leading to no protein or very little protein production. And then with an antisense that was developed um, uh, through uh, the, the work of, of uh, Frank Bennett and Adrian Craner at the Cold Spring Harbor and uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals uh, specifically, uh, they were able to show that this actually altered the splicing, led to a full-length SMN2 RNA, and led to production of protein. So that being uh, the case in animal models and some very early uh, large people studies, we came to our patient. So this is a patient with SMA type 1. Um, who came to see me just five years ago. Um, I, of course, think back on the people that came to see me five years and three months ago or five years and six months ago who we didn't have this for. Um, but uh, this young, young tyke um, was uh, present. And you can see the features of SMA, if this works. There we go. Um, and you can see her kind of belly breathing as, as we talk about. She's got weakness of her intercostal muscles, so she's already quite weak at six months. They, they're sitting her up here uh, to take a picture, but she can't breathe very well sitting up, so they're going to immediately put her down and lay, lay her back down. And if you could restart that, I'm afraid if I click again, it's going to go to the next slide. Um, uh, you can see that her legs really don't move much at all. She's got a little bit of twitching in her toes. She can lift her arms up at the elbows, but she can't lift her elbows up off the bed. So she's already quite weak at six months. So I'm showing her, not because she's the most um, dramatic case that we have. She was the first case that we treated. Um, we have other children that have done extremely well and are... Um, you know, basically walking and look much more normal. And she does not have that kind of effect because she got started uh, later. But here she is uh, recently. Uh, so she would have died within months of that first video uh, if things had followed their normal course. She had a pretty rough first year on treatment. So she and uh, her parents and I were quite nervous. But by one year of age, she was clearly... Uh, significantly stronger, and now here she is uh, five years after starting the treatment, and um, you know, she's got a life. She doesn't like me at all, so they take videos when I'm not in the room because I've been poking and prodding this poor kid for five years, so she, she knows who I am. 
And, um, but she, uh, when I'm not around, she has a very happy life. She's yelling at her baby sister and playing games and is really quite a firecracker and uh, clearly will have a life. So we're, we're quite optimistic that uh, this worked in her, uh, but we've done uh, numerous additional studies that show uh, significant benefit um, and uh, this shows that initial trial, and I'll come back to a point from this, we did have uh, in the treated group, the, the blue line on top, um, it, it shows that we did have several people still die, several babies died during the course of this from, her, from their disease before the treatment really uh, uh, kicked in. Uh, the green line is, uh, is a different study, a natural history study, uh, showing the expected uh, rate of death. Um, one of the children died because uh, he had gotten stronger. So uh, the parents didn't realize that he could turn over and unfortunately he rolled over and suffocated. Um, and I, it's just an awful story, but it's an important one because I think that it shows that there are unintended consequences to these kinds of treatments. This isn't a normal developmental pattern. Uh, we are going to uncover different phenotypes, if you will, uh, as we go through these treatments, and that's going to be even more so as now we're getting into treating uh, patients with um, other central nervous system disorders, including behavioral and cognitive, as well as emotional disorders. And I'm really kind of nervous about the, the intermediate phenotypes that we're probably going to see. But the motor phenotypes um, have clearly responded. This is just looking at the motor response in several studies we've now done. So in the red line, that's the, the patient that study from the, the, of the patient that I showed, um, they continue to get stronger now several years out, which is remarkable. The, the blue and gray lines uh, show, again, an SMA1 infant trial uh, that had a sham arm in it, uh, which you can think about the implications of in a fatal disease. Uh, but because of that, because of the strength of that data, uh, this, this drug ended up getting approved in rapid order by the FDA so that it was approved um, two months after the packet was submitted, which is uh, fairly rapid for the FDA to act, uh, largely because the data was so clean. The green line actually shows what happens um, when we treat patients prior to uh, their actually manifesting features of the weakness. So obviously we need to find these children before they're weak so we can get the treatment started uh, ASAP, uh, and some of those children are indistinguishable from normal. We expect most of them won't. We expect still that there still will be some uh, manifestation of weakness, but nonetheless, um, that's the effort. And so we're working with the state and the National Rust to get this uh, on the National uh, the Newborn Screening Panel. Um, of the patients that died in that first study that I talked about, we have had um, autopsies from uh, several of the um, very generous uh, parents that allow us to see that this antisense, even it has to be administered intrathecally, so it's given via lumbar puncture, and it gets into all the cells of the central nervous system. So this is this has given us hope uh, that this really will have a significant benefit for any number of different genetic disorders. Uh, it also has the advantage of having it has a long half-life. It's, it's measurable in the uh, tissue in, in the order of several months, but it isn't permanent. So that if, if we do overshoot or get phenotypes that are problematic, it, they will eventually wane as the, as the compound leaves. So as I said, it was approved um, in December of 2016 um, with the drug company having worked on this for decades um, and we believe that it works. Uh, the FDA was so impressed by the data that it approved it for everybody with SMA, irrespective of age, irrespective of type. I haven't talked about some of the milder forms that can appear in older children or adults. Uh, but they approved it for everything, but then it got to be problematic because of the price. The, the annual price for out years is comparable to other treatments. There are other treatments that are much more expensive, but the price per dose is absolutely staggering at $125,000 for a uh, five milliliter injection. And so that really set people's uh, minds running in terms of how to deal with this uh, on a societal basis. And that, 
question um, is still being bandied about and, um, and, and the answer is unclear. So we think that the AntiSense looks like it works. It's a clinic, proven clinical technology. We're working for SMA to get this into uh, neonates as quickly as we can. I'm going back up to Sacramento on Monday to meet with another group of legislators to see if we can spur this forward faster. Um, it's in trial. Antisense approaches are now in trial uh, for Huntington's, for some types of familial ALS. We have various uh, ideas of many disorders that should respond to this. So there's a different method out there than just gene replacement um, or the more futuristic ideas of CRISPR for in vivo uh, treatments. Um, and we think that it, it will have a place uh, for treating a number of neurodegenerative disorders. So I can't do this without a team. So this is our clinical team taking care of all these patients. We can't do the research unless the patients are well cared for. Um, several of the individuals have worked with me on these SMA trials, and we've worked with our collaborators. Um, uh, those here have worked with collaborators at our other sites at Columbia, Boston Children's, CHOP, Nemours, uh, at, and at the University of Rochester in Toronto. So I'd like to thank the patients and families. I'd like to thank our supporters. I'd like to thank CHRI for support that I received shortly after moving here and uh, really think that we're on the verge of, of truly a revolution in neuromuscular disorders and hopefully in other neurological disease. So thanks for allowing me to share this with you. I'll take it a little more slowly this time. I just want everyone to pause. I know we did some guided imagery yesterday with Heidi. I want everyone just to pause and think about what they've just heard. Yeah, these, this is not only wow science. These are two drugs for fatal pediatric diseases developed first and foremost for children. They're not hand-me-downs or as I like to say, tag-alongs from adult medicine. So it's truly a revolution in pediatric care. That takes us to our last speaker. So you've already met Jim Woody. He's been a fixture on the Packard board and a stalwart in really helping advance pediatric care here at Stanford. But he's also a pediatrician. Uh, after his medical school training, he then was at Duke and Boston Children's, contemporaneous with the likes of uh, people like Harvey Cohen, Phil Pizzo, so he certainly holds his own there. He has decades of experience in biomedical research and biomedical management. And that's, it's really only natural that we close the session with him really talking about, OK, how do we actually bring this forward? How do we do this? How do we deal with the cost? And how do we deal with the success? So it's my pleasure, our last talk, biologics and biosimilars. Jim, please. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, first, I uh, just want to thank uh, Mary Leonard uh, and her uh, CHI team for putting on this conference and taking over the helm from Hugh. That's been a, uh, a nice plus. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Grant Wells, who's here, who's actually mission control. He's the one who puts all this together, so he gets some, uh, some things as well. And the other thing is, I, I want to give a thumbs up to the sound crew and the audiovisual group. <laughs> They've done a phenomenal job for most meetings that I have attended. Actually, a, almost a uh, flawless performance. So congratulations, guys. Uh, if you were here yesterday, you hear, heard Tony Weiss talk about how cells communicate through proteins. And uh, he was talking about some of the good proteins that uh, do things and uh, that they're in uh, cord blood plasma were some that actually helped out. And I have to say, if I forget more than two passwords a week, I think I need about a gallon of this. So, so I think, think we'll all sign up for that one. All right, I want to talk a little bit about blood plasma because you heard about that yesterday. So uh, this is going to be a pop quiz. Uh, albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen make up about 99% of the uh, blood plasma. That's the, uh, the liquid part of your blood without the cells in it. So of that 1% that's left, uh, how many signaling proteins do you think there are there? 
Somebody want to guess? Well, okay. What else? All right. About 500. Okay, so there's 500 signaling proteins in there. And uh, how many do we know something about? Maybe 50? Uh, there's probably 30 or 40 trials going on, either blocking these or one thing or another. So uh, Tony talked about the good ones, and I'm going to talk about some bad ones. And uh, my talk is going to be about uh, monoclonal antibodies, and it's going to be about one of the very bad proteins uh, that are in this, uh, this set. <clears throat> so you can do two things. One is you can make a pill, a drug is... Uh, Easily, uh, typically manufactured with chemical synthesis. Uh, it's made up of a lot of chemicals put together uh, in an ordered process. Biologics are much different. They have to be grown in a live human cell or an animal cell. They're very complex to make and they're very hard. So uh, once... Uh... All right, well, all right. Uh, once you've got the uh, recipe down for uh, making drugs, it's kind of like put the mac and cheese in, push the button, and you can make tons of it. Uh, for biologics, I've got a cocoa bin recipe there at the uh, right with 15, recipe, uh, 15 components, and uh, it's difficult to make even if you do it right. Uh, biologics are about a thousand times more complex and you'd have to have your own chicken farm with live chickens that you keep alive. Uh, it is very complex, I can tell you that. Uh, biologics are given intravenously or subcutaneously and they, uh, mostly because they can't be absorbed uh, by taking them orally. The proteins are broken down. And on the right side, you can see uh, the bottom half, $18.3 billion are the uh, antibodies that are uh, the ones I'm going to talk about. Uh, so uh, the first year of a biologic therapy, for those of you who are familiar with some of these, with arthritis or psoriasis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, actually Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, it's about $30,000. Uh, the three I've mentioned here, Enbrel, Hemora, and uh, Remicade, all block a harmful protein called TNF, tumor necrosis factor. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we found uh, earlier on. This is in the pre-1980s, what rheumatoid arthritis uh, looked like. And I can say that uh, once you had this, and you, maybe some of your grandparents did, uh, that's it, your joints are destroyed. Uh, you can see the joint inflammation that's there. Uh, it's all over. And this is the very first trial of a drug to block tumor necrosis factor that I and my colleagues did. And uh, if you look on the vertical axis on the left, you'll see that some of these people had 28 joints that were uh, actually swollen and painful. And the way they did this test back then was they actually squeezed on these, and if you yelled, it got to be a painful, swollen joint. Uh, so you can try that on your friends if you want to. Uh, after a, a single dose of uh, Remicade or Infliximab, you can see it went down to less than five. And uh, with more doses, you can get it down to zero. So this is the very first time that a bad cytokine or protein was blocked by a monoclonal antibody. So uh, I'm gonna slip over here and hang on to this just a bit. I have a bad knee. Uh, we all have bad knees. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll sit down, that'll be better. Uh, so, when I was at the, uh, this trial was done in, in patients back in 1993. The entire clinic was filled with patients in wheelchairs because that's what rheumatoid arthritis was like back then. Uh, Stanford as well. And at Boston Children's Hospital, we would uh, periodically see children with rheumatoid arthritis. And I can tell you, they were doomed. They were going to be in wheelchairs. Uh, before this therapy came on. So uh, that, was a, that was a problem. We also treated patients with Crohn's disease. That was the very first trial again in, uh, in a disease with a, uh, a drug that blocked one of these bad uh, cytokines, TNF. And you can see on the uh, left there, 
that they had a Crohn's disease activity index of about uh, 300. And at 300, uh, you can't work, you can't go to school, uh, and you have to stay within 100 feet of a bathroom. So uh, these people were basically uh, disabled. And after a single dose, it came down to below 100. Now, 100 is about where we all are. So basically, they were normal, could go back to work, and could uh, go back to school or whatever they needed. So this was the first example ever of a blocking in a bad uh, cytokine. I saw lots of people with Crohn's disease at the children's hospitals that I've been at. And what happened to these children and adults is they went through multiple surgeries because they would try to remove the segment with the uh, inflammatory Crohn's disease. And uh, in a year or so, it would be back and they would be go back to surgery. So this was a, uh, really a poor outcome. And uh, this drug and the ones that followed on that are similar have taken that all away. So uh, it's a major achievement, not just for uh, adults, but pediatrics as well. And in both of our trials, we actually treated some pediatric patients, uh, so we knew this would be effective in their case uh, as well. So one of the things I'm particularly proud of is because of these anti-TNF inhibitors, there are no rheumatoid arthritis patients in wheelchairs anywhere in the world where these drugs are available. Uh, and I view that as a major, major achievement uh, as we go along. And active living is now possible because we can not only uh, clear up the arthritis, we can save the joints. Because once the joints are damaged with arthritis, that's it. You can't get them back uh, and you're disabled. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, uh, my son-in-law is a surgeon who has rheumatoid arthritis and he takes Humora and he's doing just fine. So uh, along the way, this was a major achievement at blocking uh, one of the bad communicators that are found in the serum. So where are we today? Okay, well, this is a very large market because these things work. Uh, and they don't have a lot of toxicity generally. There's some risk of infection and uh, some very tiny risk of lymphoma and other things. But compared to being uh, in a wheelchair for the rest of your life, uh, people will take that trade off. Humora is probably the best-selling one. It's the best one these days. Uh, Remicade has moved down. Uh, Rituxan and uh, Enbrel are ones that are, are commonly used. Uh, the only thing I want to make out of this slide, if you look at the right side here, you see the patents around these things are expiring somewhere between uh, 2015 and 2019. And that opens the way for people to make what we call biosimilars. And I'm going to talk about that. So biosimilars are like generic drugs, except they're uh, significant hurdles. So in order to meet the standards of uh, interchangeability, the sponsor has to demonstrate that the, uh, the biosimilar drug, which is made in the same way and is almost identical, actually sometimes totally identical with the reference product, uh, it has the same clinical result. And they also have to show that if you switch from the uh, reference drug to a uh, biosimilar, uh, there's no greater risk of uh, the product not working or that there will be some other kinds of uh, toxicity. So the hurdle is, uh, is fairly high. Uh, the Europeans have been way ahead of us on this. Uh, they started approving biosimilars in 2005. And by uh, 2018, over 23 were approved, and there are 16 more under review at the present time. They were able to show that uh, since they approved these, they've been looking at this for 10 years, and they're uh, convinced that they can be used safely and effectively in all the approved indications for these biosimilars. The uh, U.S. started uh, reviewing biosimilars in 2010 under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and we now have in red here an abbreviated approval process for biologic products uh, that are demonstrated to be highly similar uh, to, and interchangeable with the, uh, with the reference, reference drug. Uh, we've approved about 10 or 11 of these, and uh, you can see that uh, Remicade or Infliximab is right up there at the top because it's an older drug, and it was a great target for everybody to copy. So uh, there are a lot of those uh, out there. 
Uh, now, I want you to look to the very uh, right, slide of this, right side of this slide. And you'll see this says approved in 1916 for all indications, but not yet marketed. Now, what does that mean? Uh, and on the bottom here, it says US law allows in the US patent infringement, invalidation, and antitrust litigation. And it's called the patent dance. And the people, the pharmaceutical companies that are selling the reference drug uh, do not want the biosimilar to get on the market. So it's basic, uh, basic economics. And so they try to delay this by charging that the biosimilar has infringed their patents or their patents are invalid. And they go into litigation for four years. And uh, in my mind, this is the uh, Full Employment Act for patent lawyers. And uh, if you want a good life, uh, join a patent law firm and do the biosimilars. You'll be uh, happy and rich for a long time. Uh, there's 10 or 11 biosimilars under uh, consideration at the uh, present time. Uh, hopefully some of these will be approved. You can see on the right there, they're coming up for review in uh, 2018. Now I just talked about antibodies, uh, and, but there's a whole range of, of uh, biologics that do things like stimulate uh, red cell growth or white cell growth or any number of things. But I just focused on the antibodies because that's where I've had the, uh, the, the most experience uh, in doing this. And I've actually been asked to uh, comment on some of these uh, patent litigation claims. And I can tell you they're extremely complex. They come in hundreds of pages of uh, material to try to uh, fight off a biosimilar. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to be a challenge for the US. We really need to change this law is what we need to do and go more like the uh, Europeans do. Uh, OK, so where are biosimilars being studied? You might think this is just US, but not at all. There's over 340 clinical trials going on. And you can see from the circles, uh, they're all over the world. Uh, and lots of countries that can't afford the, uh, the price of the uh, Humora or Enbrel or uh, a Remicade uh, are using the biosimilars and are doing the trials there because they're much, much less expensive. So this is going to be an uh, area you'll hear a lot more about in the future. Uh, one of the things that uh, people ask me is, why aren't there more trials and medications in uh, pediatrics? Uh, about 20% of the drugs uh, are FDA approved for children. Uh, the clinicians we have here and at all the pediatric hospitals are actually artists. And they're able to use these drugs in very effective ways in children by managing the doses uh, and, and making it work for us. So that's, uh, they're, they're remarkable in their achievements at, at, at doing this. Pharmaceutical companies generally view pediatrics as a very small market. Uh, and uh, pediatric studies are uh, hard to carry out. Uh, you need child-friendly sites and uh, equipment for children. Uh, clinical procedures like blood, blood drawing are problematic. I don't know if you've taken your child to the doctor and said, hey, you've got to have your blood draw, drawn. Uh, that's hardly ever greeted with enthusiasm in my experience. And uh, sometimes the uh, parents can consent. And uh, if you're in a trial that requires, say, colonoscopies or some invasive procedures, they'll just say, no way. Uh, and so now you're stuck, even though the parents are trying to convince the child of the greater good, but it doesn't work. Uh, in some infants, uh, the metabolism is different. Uh, and uh, I can tell you a single adverse event, something really sad that happens in a child, could halt an entire multi-million dollar development program. So that's why pharmaceutical companies are cautious and so it's up to us as pediatricians to uh, carefully try to adopt these for use in, uh, in, uh, in, in patients. And uh, quite a lot of us have done that. In fact, Mary Leonard has done some phenomenal studies on uh, bone preservation with, uh, with Remicade. Uh, really, really interesting things that nobody would have uh, thought of doing. Uh, FDA does encourage these uh, studies. Uh, you get a six months patent life extension, uh, and the FDA can require you to do pediatric studies if, uh, if you're going to be using it in pediatrics. So in summaries, uh, biosimilars are not like chemical drugs. They're very complex. FDA requires full extensive trials. There's over 40 biosimilars under various degrees of study in, uh, in the US. 
overall good for patients. They would re reduce the price 20 to 30 uh, percent. And uh, if you want to follow this on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, level, uh, there is a website called bigmoleculewatch.com. So why do I present this today to this group? And this is old news, because everybody knows these things work. Some of you may even have uh, had these drugs administered for one thing or another. Uh, first of all, when we started this trial with anti-TNF, uh, the key opinion leaders said we had it wrong. That was the wrong cytokine. TNF wasn't the thing that was important. Uh, and this would never work, and they would all die of infection. And so I guess the message there is the, uh, the key opinion leaders aren't always right. And uh, you should be uh, just a little adventurous in some of the things you do with the young people in here. And I want you to take your invention and your, your thoughts and actually put it into the clinic and try it. If you fail, that's okay, but you've tried. Uh, and that's the way we'll progress with uh, organizations like CHRI. Uh, the other thing is that to develop a real therapy, you're gonna have eventually have to turn this over to a company where they can focus on getting the trials done. These are very expensive, uh, but that's part of the, uh, part of the process. Uh, and now if you have a, um, a patent idea, that you think is, uh, is important, even though it's a little bizarre. Uh, we don't much talk about economics here, but uh, when I was chief scientific officer at Senecor, I licensed the patent from Len Hertzenberg. Uh, Len Hertzenberg and Lee Hertzenberg are known for uh, inventing the fluorescent activated cell sorter, but they also filed some very peculiar patents on the production of proteins inside of cells, which I licensed. Uh, the school, of medicine, the technology office, uh, and the Hertzenbergs were able to secure 3% of $6 billion a year for probably 10 years. So uh, that funded a lot of things that all of you young people are doing for many times. And I was told that after Google, it was the highest uh, value OTC uh, product that we had from, uh, from Stanford. So uh, you're, uh, you're young. Uh, you have major problems to solve. Uh, biologics might help because they, uh, they block these uh, messengers uh, and there's a lot of good ones and there's some bad ones there. There's probably 30 or 40 trials against bad cytokines that are out there that are going on. And uh, there's a couple of conditions that I'd like you to work on and solve and they're uh, interesting. One is uh, autism. And we see this in one in 68 children now and it may be that there's something from the mother that goes to the child that could be blocked with the biologic. I don't know what it is, but it's up to you to solve that. And the other end of the spectrum is Alzheimer's. We really don't know what's going on there. So I'll stop there and say thank you for your attention. That was fantastic, Jim. I'm gonna ask everyone to come on up and join me. We may not be the most highly mobile but we're the most mentally nimble group here. <laughs> I so I'm going to take moderator privilege, well, and, just to... and I'm going I'm to start. Um, this is a wow session, but you know, I, I read in a, a journal last week, it was actually the Wall Street Journal, that Avexis, one of the companies making a product for spinal muscular atrophy, was bought by Novartis to the tune of $8.7 billion. And so... How do we deal with this? Do we wait for the market? Do we wait for patents to expire? Because as I like to say, the real time is now. We've got kids in the clinics, just like you did with SMA, that need to be treated now. So, I mean, yeah, in terms of the cost, I mean, you know, I didn't talk about the AAV approach for SMA. We're very much involved in that as well. We've treated two patients here. I think it is going to work well, but I think it, you know, economics are going to end up steering some of these decisions. Well, I think you, uh, you know, between the uh, uh, Child Health Institute and Spark and other things that we have, we get some initial funding to actually make a proof of concept, kind of like you've heard with the, uh, with the CAR T-cells and all the phenomenal things you're doing with that as we invent these things here. Uh, we need to support uh, proof of concept in a couple of patients. And at that point, the uh, pharmaceutical companies become interested because they... Uh, they actually uh, 
feel that small numbers of patients that you can treat well are a, a quite a good market. So this has changed in the last five years. And companies like Biomarin and others are totally focused on small, severe diseases that you can treat. So my advice is that have the organization, the School of Medicine and others support these till you get a little proof of concept uh, and then you can interest them. Uh, sometimes they think it's such a great idea they'll just buy it right away, but in general that's the case. And then you can maybe get them to do some compassionate use patients where you don't pay anything and they'll try the uh, product out. Uh, that uh, they will do sometimes. We, we had, a, it's been interesting actually, um, John and I both are sitting on a committee that's been formed for high cost drugs because the, both the Kimraya and the Spinraza have been such a different kind of a therapy for our patients and they are so expensive um, that it, it's really forcing us and all the ins other institutions around the country to think about, you know, how, how do we deal with this as an institution? How do we, you know, help to influence policy around this so that we can provide access to patients, but we're not gonna actually bankrupt the institution, um, which is the two kind of terrifying, uh, you know, battles we have. I mean, part of the problem is that it's just a different treatment regimen because uh, there are enzymes that get replaced on a weekly or, or every other week basis that end up having a much higher annual cost than you know, either of the, of the treatments we're talking about. But, um, but because these are treated infrequently for, somebody asked the question, I mean, about SMA, there's a loading sequence and then they get a dose every four months. And to recoup costs, I don't know. I don't know how they set these prices, honestly. I mean, that cost gets, gets distilled down for that individual treatment. And for, for the gene therapy, it's, it's gonna be theoretically, hypothetically one and done. And so that all gets done in one single intravenous infusion. So estimates are for the gene therapy that it'll run between three and $5 million for a single nine milliliter, 30 minute IV injection. And I mean, that, I mean, we just have to have other ways of, of thinking about this. And the companies think they can justify it, but that's obviously out of my... Well, I want, to, I want to extend that. I'm going to go with one of the questions from the audience about oversight. I just want to add to the question. Um, we're very grateful. Thanks for the CHRI, Hugh and Mary. We're, we're spoiled here at Stanford, but the rest of the world isn't that spoiled. We have kids all over. We have kids throughout the world that are not here at Stanford. And... You know, Jim, you mentioned the Best Pharmaceuticals to Children Act, the BPCA, and I just wrote a piece uh, in the last month or so. I'm not so sure that works. Um, it was a concept that was turn of the century to take adult drugs and bring them to pediatrics, but you can probably tell by my remarks earlier, it's time for us not only to be researchers and pediatricians, but we need to be advocates. And I think we need to start thinking about pediatrics first, not hand-me-down. So, what, what kind of oversight is needed? What do we need to do in terms of oversight? Do we need a new um, revision to BPCA? Uh, all of you? Jim? Uh, I, I can say a little bit about price uh, cost setting. And so what's commonly done is they'll take a disease and they'll say, how much does it cost to take care of this patient for their uh, lifetime? And uh, then they'll say, if you can cure this disease, this is what it's worth, and they'll uh, argue that case with the insurance companies and the CMS and things like that to set a price. I mean, as you, as you pointed out, if you can actually cure a person with leukemia and they can become productive citizens for a long time, it has a value. And that's what they do in the U.S. Now, other countries uh, just say, no way, we're not going to pay that. And uh, they, they manage. Uh, yes, we could use some, uh, some additional legislation that supports the, uh, the trials in pediatrics especially, and uh, that'll have to come out of Congress. But pediatrics even, uh, even there are uh, kind of a, uh, not, at the, not at the forefront uh, just because we're a small population in the scheme of uh, the overall uh, healthcare system. Uh, John, Kara? Yeah, well, with regard to the question that also came up about Europeans, I mean, I have participated in some workshops with uh, health economists from uh, Europe and the United States uh, trying to understand these things. And, and at least as, at, at those tables, uh, obvious solutions were not available. I mean, you know, a lot of the same questions were coming up. 
And I think to touch on your point about how do we make these things accessible to patients who aren't here, that's also been a huge challenge. I mean, uh, we just this week have been talking about, we've gotten many patients internationally who want to come here to receive Kim Raya or get on study um, and trying to say, well, you know, you're going to need to come and find some money to get here. But for the commercial product, there's no, you know, uh, access to it for patients who are outside of the U.S. right now, aside from trials. It's a challenge. We have a few minutes left. I want to come back to the a topic that both you and Jim raised in terms of risk tolerance. We're very averse to risk in pediatrics. And like you, early in my career, uh, I was part of an NCI trial that got shut down after seven patients because of neurotoxicity. But do we need to rethink how much we tolerate in children? We have this idea that one terrible adverse event and we shut down the trial and throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. Kara? I mean, I think that, um, so I'm a, I'm a baby when it comes to doing clinical trials, but I'm learning a lot. And one of the things that I think about a lot is how bad is the disease? Like, what is the alternative? And so then how can we help to figure out what is the level of risk that we're willing to tolerate? So something like DIPG, which is universally fatal in about a year's time, even though it's terrifying to think about giving a car for that disease, but if it could cure a patient, the alternative is, you know, death. And so the toxicity, your, potentially your tolerance for toxicity is higher in those cases. It's hard though, but the, the trial I mentioned actually was a DIPG trial, and that was shut down for toxicity because it was, oh my gosh, what have we done? And instead of a disease that had survival of nine or 10 months, we were giving the children survivals of three, four, and five months. It was a horrible feeling right. as a pediatrician. But Jim, you had some thoughts too. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, convincing people that the um, risk for some toxicity versus the benefit is something we'll have to do. Uh, the U.S. is generally risk averse, as, as, as you've heard, uh, and it's harder here. In Europe, that's not quite the case. In many areas, they're saying, you know, if we're going to cure this disease or uh, give these people a productive life for the rest of their life, we'll take some more risks. So it's partially the culture and the attitude that uh, none of these drugs should ever be harmful. But uh, in real life, uh, we're not quite sure how they're going to behave. And uh, uh, we need to be able to take somewhat more, more risk, as you pointed out, with the CNS toxicity, with the CAR T cells, uh, unexpected. But the trade-off is uh, you're, you're not going to last long with your cancer. So... Uh, in that case, uh, in college, they'll take some more risks. And that, that's an example, I think, uh, that we could, should follow in other diseases, especially in yours in SMA. I mean. Yeah, final word. Yeah. We've got 30 seconds left, John. Yeah. Final word in, in not oncology. How much risk? I mean, oh, I think that it's substantial. It's interesting. The equation changes when you think you have a definitive treatment. Right. So, you know, where these children, you know, would get pneumonia and die in the past, now they're getting pneumonia and getting intubated and cared for in the ICU for many months hoping that the drug kicks in. And, you know, it's just a different equation, I think. I think my other concern about this is what I mentioned in my talk about these intermediate phenotypes. I think that we are going to see that. We're, we're just launching into some of these treatments with uh, gene modification uh, in disorders that do affect thought processes. And what is, what is a halfway treated thought process? What does that look like in someone? And, you know, do we, you know, just keep our foot on the gas or, or do we pull back at that point? I, I think there, we're in for a pretty wild ride here, I think, for a few years. So as our psychiatry colleagues say, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're going to take a break and I encourage you to ask all of us questions in the hallway. Thank you so much for a great session, guys. Thanks.